Taryn, hi. It's it's weird to see you in this environment. Is your headset making you feel dizzy by any chance? Because mine is. Ever so slightly, but I feel like I've lost track of what is real and what isn't now living in this virtual space with you. <laughs> <laughs> I think these hand things are the most confusing. I just don't know whether they're too razzmatazz. What do you think? Speaking of razzmatazz, I mean, for those that don't know you, of course, this avatar is entirely photo real, but um, I think we'll slowly all get used to it as we all spend more time in the metaverse and become more comfortable <laughs> with its weird foibles. But for now, I can definitely see your hands floating separate to your body. <laughs> that will take some getting used to. <laughs> OK, well, should we give this a go then? Shall we start? Sounds great. Hi there, I'm Deborah Ishihara and today I'm recording in the metaverse for the first time ever. Lots of companies are starting to create workspaces here and being employment lawyers at Use the Boris, we're particularly interested in the sorts of issues this new environment might throw up for HR. So I have my avatar on and I'm going to focus today on potential issues based on avatar design. Here to explore all this with me is Taryn Tawalkley, partner in our UK law firm Lewis Silkin, and Taryn's going to be my guide. Hi Taryn, thank you for joining me here in these very unfamiliar surroundings. Hi Deborah, and thank you for hosting me in space. First of all, I thought I'd dress up for the occasion, and I've got myself, as you can see, a pretty cool avatar. I should just say that it doesn't actually look like me at all, but given the subject we're going to talk about is avatar design, I thought this might be a good visual aid. So, Taryn, you've just recently written an article for us called Are We Ready for the Metaverse? And it looks at issues around diversity, inclusion and avatar design. Um, the thinking generally is that, unlike me, people will probably choose avatars that look more or less like them when they work in the metaverse. But what if they don't want to? What if they want to change or enhance themselves? And what if their employer wants them to stick with an avatar that matches them closely? Taryn, any thoughts? It's a really interesting question, Deborah. Although the metaverse and how employers will utilise it is still relatively nascent, I think you're right that on the whole, it's likely that in professional environments like online workplaces, we'll see them being populated by photoreal avatars or other similar avatars that have been permitted by the employer's policies. However, there are a couple of things worth talking about. First, we don't know yet how much interoperability there will be between parts of the metaverse. If you have personal avatars, which are impossibly cool, like you look today, and I'm thinking of the skins that you get in Fortnite, employees may well want to use them for all of their activities in the metaverse, especially if they've taken a lot of time, possibly even a lot of cost in preparing them, or if they feel that their avatars are more representatives of themselves in the virtual world. Secondly, there may actually be some employers that want to give employees the freedom over avatar choice. It's likely to be something that's popular with staff, and it can also potentially leverage the popularity of employees in the virtual world if there is sufficient interoperability. I'm thinking influencer status avatars used across both personal and professional environments. That said, even if avatars are meant to be photo real, we are all surely going to have a natural tendency to pick improved versions of ourselves. There's a really interesting phenomenon called the Proteus effect, which explains how behavior in an online world can be influenced by your choice of avatar. So an avatar's dress, height, or even attractiveness can influence how we will respond to them in the virtual world. What does that mean for professional avatars? Will our natural instincts combined with the Proteus effect drive a tendency towards taller, thinner, more attractive avatars in order to try and be treated in the most favorable way? Possibly. I suppose the final thing that's worth saying about this as well is choice of avatars may well be restricted by pre-populated options or choices offered by developers. Uh, for those of you that are into computer games, it's the uh, time of the year when the new FIFA game comes out. And for anyone that ever plays that like I do, you'll know if you look like I do, it's actually quite difficult to create a manager avatar that does look like you. So some of the options may well be limited by what developers enable, at least at the very outset of the metaverse. 
Now, the avatar I'm using for this interview is a white person, which does match my offline identity, in fact. But what if I'd chosen an avatar from a different ethnic group? And what if others in my workplace who do have that ethnicity offline think what I'm doing is inappropriate? How should my employer mediate that or should they mediate it? I think for this very reason, we're going to see employers and others in professional contexts restrict or have policies around the appropriate use of avatars or a policy that requires photo real avatars. In theory, there's absolutely nothing wrong with you picking an avatar which doesn't look like you do. As I say, and in particular in the environment which we find ourselves in today, it may be absolutely appropriate if I wanted an avatar that looked like an alien or something else impossibly cool or unreal. But the scope for your avatar choice to come into question in a professional context is quite high, in particular if you're displaying, for example, stereotypes associated with the ethnicity of the avatar you've chosen as part of, quote unquote, banter in the workplace, just like we would see in the real world. That said, there can be circumstances, in my view, where it actually would be appropriate and potentially useful to adopt use of avatars with different ethnicities or even different sexes to you in the real world. For example, I can see this being useful in equal opportunities training or in other coaching contexts in the professional world. And what if I were pregnant, say? I can actually imagine wanting to be able to represent that in my avatar for work. So could I do that? And conversely, it's also possible that I might want to hide my pregnancy. What should an employer's policy be on this? Again, it's a really interesting one, and I think it's going to be one that's going to be very dangerous to start policing too much with policies. Firstly, I think, again, choice may well be limited initially by what developers enable at the outset. It took a while before we saw the first Apple pregnant Memoji, but these things will no doubt come. I think one of the most interesting questions is what the impact of the metaverse is on these sorts of issues. Uh, Many employees can feel under pressure to disclose a pregnancy in the office when they feel like they are showing, but that isn't necessarily true in an online world. You could be happily interacting with colleagues without them being any the wiser in virtual environments. And wouldn't it just prove the theory if, as a result, we saw increased promotions or opportunities coming the way of individuals who weren't as visibly pregnant? workplace, both whilst in employment, but also even potentially in an interviewing context. And supposing my manager is persistently rude to me about a characteristic of my avatar that I don't actually possess in real life. Say I made my avatar obese or gave it a disability of some kind that I don't have. Is that actionable? I think this is another thorny issue which will come to be decided by future courts and tribunals in each of our markets. But taking the UK, for example, the Equality Act here has never needed, for example, physical touch to find sexual harassment. In fact, you can be protected under UK employment law on grounds of association or even perception of having protected characteristics. So bullying a person for being obese in a virtual world or harassing them because of a perceived characteristic may too result in claims. And what about my very cool haircuts? Can my employer prevent me from having a haircut like this online if it goes against its ordinary offline dress policy? And what if I tried to negotiate with my employer? What if I said I'd stick with my more conventional haircut in real life and that I wouldn't do any meetings in the metaverse with clients? Would that be enough, do you think? I think this brings up all of the questions we've seen employers grapple with for years around uniform and dress code policies, which have we've seen raise issues around discrimination on grounds of sex, you know, requirements for high heels and so forth, issues on religious discrimination, where employers have policies around uh, visible manifestation of those religions, for example, crucifixes. And we've also seen the great relaxation caused by the pandemic, where all of us have worked from home in various states of pajamas or professional work attire for the past few years. I suppose the good news from all of that context, though, is employers are pretty used to the relevant legal frameworks, and we just need to apply those to the new possibilities opened up by the metaverse. I'd just like to explore the issue now of sexual harassment for a moment. Obviously, this is a significant problem in the real world, but do you imagine it being an issue in workplaces in the metaverse too? And if so, how's that likely to manifest itself in your view, Taryn? Yeah, I think, as you say, as much as I wish uh, we didn't have to accept this was a problem in the real world, it is, and that runs true for the metaverse as well, regrettably. 
um, as I say, the metaverse is very much in its infancy and already it has a groping problem with stories of avatars being harassed and abused in online environments. Some apps have even developed mandatory distance rules and put them in place between avatars to try and limit the risks here. However, as I say, at least in the UK, the Equality Act has never required the need for a physical touch. So just as is true in the real world, you could sexually harass uh, an employee or one could sexually harass another employee in the online world exactly as they could do in the real world without a need for physical touch, but possibly even with virtual touch. So we've mainly been focusing so far on possible discrimination against people for their avatar's characteristics. But what about liability for misconduct using an avatar? If I misbehave, can I just say that wasn't me, that was my avatar? <laughs> um, avatars are not independent thinkers, of course. So if an employee misbehaves in the metaverse, it's not really going to be a defence to say my avatar did it. That said, much like the sort of dog ate my homework level of defense we see in other parts of real life, no doubt there will be some people that try and run these sorts of arguments. However, I can see there might be some limited cases of genuine glitches causing issues or movement caused by a mouse slip or pressing the wrong key or other glitches caused by Wi-Fi failures. But I, I wouldn't place too much uh, or, or plan for these sorts of excuses to hold too much water. Thinking about misconduct a little bit more then, in recent years, we've all had to work out what the norms should be for social media. So what you can safely say about an employer and who you can share it with and all that sort of thing. It strikes me that in the metaverse, um, those issues could really be amplified many times over. What are your thoughts on this, Taryn? Can you give us a flavour of the sorts of questions that might arise? Absolutely. And again, I think this is going to come down to the question of how much interoperability there is. But Picking up on your example, we've seen a lot of this with LinkedIn and Twitter, where personal and professional obligations can clash. On the one hand, we've seen employers trying to claim ownership of Twitter followers, LinkedIn connections, and then equally, even in purely personal environments, we've seen individuals' personal conduct impacting them in the professional world. For example, individuals making racist or other provocative tweets in a personal capacity being linked back to their employer, potentially damaging that employer's reputation and those individuals being subject to disciplinary action. So we could see very similar issues based on the personal conduct of individuals in the metaverse, in particular if there's a high degree of interoperability between those professional spaces and public ones where the wider population can see and interact with you. Now, Taryn, you practice UK law, but if an employer sets up a workplace in the metaverse, where are they operating from exactly? And what if you're an international business with teams that meet from all over the world and there's an issue of harassment, say? Whose law would apply to that and how could it be enforced? I think jurisdiction in the metaverse is a very thorny issue. And where so much still remains unclear about how it will operate in practice, I think it's probably too early to speculate on the potential extremities of the question. But thinking about it at its most simple level, I would think about a question like that in the same way as we do today. For example, if an employee posted a comment in a Slack channel or a Teams group and another employee in another market or jurisdiction responded with something derogatory, you're already going to have a similar sort of clash where potentially the grievance raised by employee one will be handled in accordance with the policy in their market, but the potential disciplinary against employee two may well have to be held in accordance with their local laws. OK, well, sadly, we need to wrap up now. But thanks so much, Taryn, for all your thoughts on this. As it will be very obvious to people watching this, there are so many more questions about the metaverse at this point than we can actually give you a concrete answer to. But I think we've at least made a start. And over the next few months, we'll be thinking, writing and talking lots more about all these and other metaverse issues. You can find a link to Taryn's metaverse article in the show notes, and you can find both his and my contact details there too. If you want to know more about how Use the Boris can help Help you with any aspect of your HR practice, not just the metaverse, do look at our website at usetheboris.com. There's loads of information there on all sorts of employment-related topics. I'm Deborah Shihara, and it's been a pleasure.